Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Did you have enough food? You know, we laugh, but the tradition of Thanksgiving is quickly changing. In fact, um, people are rewriting, or at least attempting to rewrite the history of Thanksgiving, that first Thanksgiving. Back in 1620, when the English settled in what today is known as Plymouth, Massachusetts. You know, they were not, that wasn't their intended destination, it was Virginia. But as they landed there, uh, what they found were Native Americans who were willing to help. They, they formed community. In fact, half of those pilgrims passed, not only from a long, hard winter, lack of shelter, but also lack of food. And if it weren't for those Native Americans teaching them how to build, teaching them how to farm that land, they wouldn't have had the harvest they had in 1621 in order to celebrate what we now know as that first Thanksgiving. But listen to what Bar Barnard College wrote in 2013 as they sent an email to faculty and students. They said this, Happy Turkey Day. Thanksgiving is complicated. We urge you not to forget that this holiday commemorates genocide and American imperialism. That's not the way Thanksgiving began. It's not the way their settlement began. There was community. But in 2019, Barnard College wasn't alone. The New Yorker, they connected the existence of Thanksgiving to historical evils in American history. Again, liberal media trying to rewrite the history of Thanksgiving. Well, Media Research Center Director of Media Analysis, Jeffrey Dickens, he offered his explanation for why journalists in Hollywood are rejecting the holiday. He said this, a lot of it stems from the Marxist anti-American ideology that is pushed in academia that a lot of the journalism school grads have been subject to today. There is also a religious aspect to the holiday, expressing gratitude for blessings of faith, family, and living in a free country that sadly many in the secular press are not comfortable discussing. In other words, as people try to rewrite the history of Thanksgiving, they do it in order from a secular standpoint to remove faith from our history, faith in Jesus Christ. And the lies are inaccurate, intentional, and they're indoctrinating the younger generation. But over and over again throughout Scripture, we are called to be like those first pilgrims who, when they met in community with those Native Americans and they ate together that first meal after harvest, they celebrated in community, faith first, praying together. And it reminds us that you and I have to celebrate with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying constantly to the Lord, thanking him for his provision in our lives. And that's exactly what Psalms does, the Psalms. We're going to read from Psalm 100. If you would turn there with me in your Bibles, and we're going to read from Psalm 100, and we're going to learn what Psalm 100 has to say to us about being thankful, just like those first pilgrims of 1621. Listen to what the psalmist writes. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. As we came in Bright Christian Church today, I hope that we came with an expectation, an attitude of expressing our gratitude to God in worship. Is that the way we came in, church family? That we're excited to be here and to worship, to gather and worship together as a family in Christ, the one true living God who is worthy of our worship. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. The Psalms were written as prayers, praises, and songs. They were put to instruments. This is the Hebrew psalm book. That's the way that we can look at it. And psalm 100 continues in verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, 
the sheep of his flock. You have trouble thinking of things to be grateful for today? Anyone? I mean, sometimes we might be going through a terrible time. The loss of a mother, as Tony just expressed. Many people dealing with illness, cancer, surgeries in our church family, loss. Some have lost their jobs recently, struggling to put food on the table. Is it hard sometimes to find things to be thankful for, church family, is it? If we need reasons to be thankful today, let me give you five as we study this psalm. Here's one reason. Be thankful for, or because, excuse me, God created us. Isn't that what Psalm 100 tells us? Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. In Psalm 139, David, he says this about God creating him. Verses 13 and 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Do you think David knew the Lord well? In fact, David even considered God his shepherd. David, who was a shepherd, understood that God was his shepherd, the one who had created him. And simply because God created us, he is worthy of worship, and we should be thankful. He didn't have to do it. And yet he had you in mind. He created you, and you, just like David, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are unique in the way that God created you. As the psalmist continues in Psalm 100, verse 4, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. Did you catch what verse 5 says? For the Lord is good and his what? Love endures forever. Need a reason to be thankful? Be thankful because God loves us. He loves us. In fact, in uh, the Gospel of Luke, there's a chapter where there are three lost things. Do you remember? There's the lost coin, there's the lost sheep, and there's the lost son. And when Jesus is speaking of that lost sheep, he says, if he had a hundred in the field and one were lost, he would leave the 99 in the open country and he would go after the one. God loves us so much that we were the one. We were that lost one. If we've committed our life to Christ, we were the one that God came after. And it was through his son, Jesus Christ. In Psalm 107, four times, God's love is mentioned. If you look over in Psalm 107 with me, just very quickly, notice that in Psalm 107, verse 1, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Verse 8, Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Verse 15, let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. Over and over again throughout the Psalms speaks of God's unfailing love for us. We just finished the book of Ephesians last week in a series called Download. I think it's appropriate to bring up Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. It says, but because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been what? Saved. It is by God's grace, the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, taking the death we deserved to give us the life we don't deserve. Here's number three. God saves us. God created us, 
God loves us and God saves us. Romans 8, 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. John 3, 16 is the most quoted verse in the Bible. You know the verse by heart, don't you? For God so that he gave his, that whoever would, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Aren't you grateful that Jesus came to save us? Maybe you saw in the news this week the pardoning of a turkey. It's been going on since 1940, pardoning of turkeys. Presidents have been doing this since about 1940. But it was about 200 years after George Washington issued the first uh, presidential proclamation of the day of public thanksgiving that George H.W. Bush, maybe you remember this, he stepped before reporters and 30 elementary school students and this was on November 17th of 1989 in the Rose Garden. And he uh, pardoned this 50-pound turkey. But it was the first time that a president had added something to that pardon. In fact, one of the things that President uh, Bush did at the time was that he said that he noticed that the turkey was nervous. Anybody remember that? Anyone here old enough to read? We've got so many kids in here, they're like, I, I don't even know when that happened. But he said that the turkey was um, noticeably nervous. And then he said this, let me assure you and this fine Tom turkey that he will not end up on anyone's dinner plate. Not this guy. He's granted a presidential pardon as of right now. You know, every year, since about 1940, presidents have done this. It's a tradition. They pardon one turkey. Do you know what Jesus did at his death and resurrection? He pardoned a bunch of people, not turkeys, people. <laughs> he pardoned us. Those who would accept that gift of grace given by Jesus Christ and him alone receive the pardon and we do not experience the punishment and the penalty of sin and death because of what Jesus did for us. Anyone grateful that God saves us, that he makes a way, that he gives that gift of grace? We ought to be thankful today. Here's number four. He sustains us. Daily provision. And not only do... Many of the Psalms speak of this, but Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. You see, God is the one who takes us into pasture, who gives us provision, gives us our daily bread. And I would just have you pause right now and think about with God's provision for you, who are the people that God has placed in your life who have cared for you, walked with you, prayed with you, stood with you? See, God blesses us time and time again, not just with our daily bread, but God blesses us daily with one blessing after another. Do we see it? Or are we too busy being caught up in distractions or discouragement? that we cannot see the blessings that God has placed in our lives. He sustains us. John 15, 5, Jesus said this, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. We can't do anything that's full of purpose. We can't do anything that is fruitful in this life without a pursuit of Jesus Christ. We can't do anything meaningful without pursuing Jesus Christ. He is the one that sustains us in our daily life. Are we connected to him? Are we connected to the vine? And here's number five. God sanctifies us. 
This is powerful. When you think about where you were at when you gave your life to Christ, you think about how he has sanctified you, and that simply means that he has transformed you, he has changed you, that there has been spiritual growth. When we align our lives with his word and we pursue his way, when we invite Christ into our lives, no matter what we've gone through, no matter what we've done, Jesus changes everything, doesn't he? And he sanctifies us by his truth. On the last night of Jesus' life in John chapter 17, that's exactly what he prayed in John 17, 1 through 5. After telling the Father, I've completed the work that you sent me to do. Now glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. He prays for his disciples. He prays for future disciples. And he says, sanctify them by your Truth. Your word is truth. Are we being changed by the truth from the living God? Are we seeking Christ in his word? Are we studying? Are we at the feet of Jesus on a regular basis, reading his word and applying it to our life so that God can transform whatever situation we're in? Struggling in a marriage, can God fix it? Jesus changes everything. Struggling with an addiction, can God take it? We have to be willing to give it to him, right? We have to be willing to walk with him, sanctified by the truth. Struggling financially, struggling in family relationships, broken or burdened over a sin, tempted and tried. Can Jesus take that? Can he change our circumstances? Will he forgive, he can save, and he can change. He can change us. The question is, do we really want him to change us? I think that's the problem in many churches today. We have such a soft Christianity today in our culture. We're not telling people to change. We're saying, come in, God accepts you where you are. And that's true, isn't it, church? God does accept us where we are. But he loves us too much to leave us there. And that's what we need to be telling people. God wants to take us on a journey that's full of change for the better. Because God knows what's better in your life and in mine. And there's no, no circumstance he can't change for the better. It's what we need to be sharing with people. He sanctifies us by his truth and puts our life on mission for him. Anyone go Black Friday shopping? Anyone? Be honest. Raise your hands if you went Black shop Friday shopping. A few people are honest in here. No, I'm kidding. Actually, you probably prove the point that was in the media was that many uh, retail stores said that this year was an absolute flop. Anyone know the history of Black Friday, by the way? This started back in the 1950s. It was not a positive thing in the 1950s. In Philadelphia, just before the Army-Navy game following... Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, people rushed into retailers to buy things. There were people coming for those games, and it made uh, it very difficult for the Philadelphia Police Department. They had to work long shifts. People working in retail jobs worked long shifts. And it was a dark time in Philadelphia because of the fights that broke out. There are no fights that break out on Good Friday today, are there? We keep the police busy, don't we? But the police were so busy, they were tired and exhausted, and so were people. But it also made way for shoplifters to take advantage of retailers as people rushed into those stores. It was a dark time in Philadelphia. In fact, retailers tried to put a spin on that and make Black Friday a positive thing, and it didn't work out until the 1980s. And as they kept pushing the marketing for Black Friday to be a positive thing, saying, hey, if we have people come in and support these stores during Black Friday, they, many of them can move from the red to the black. And that's exactly the story today, is that they've made that transition in marketing Black Friday to be a positive thing. Well, not so positive in 2022, retailers were empty, and they said it's because most people are doing online shopping. It's not because we're spending less, it's because we're spending more online. We don't want to stand in line at the stores. Well, you know, Black Friday made me think as I was thinking about retailers who would move from the red 
to the black being profitable. I was thinking that there's one Black Friday, there's one Black Friday that paid the debt for every one of us, took us from being in the red, a debt we could not pay, and put us in the black, and we do not deserve it. And that Black Friday was the night, the, the day that Jesus was killed on the cross. Aren't you grateful for that Black Friday that gave us redemption? It's a redemption story. Well, Hebrews 12, 28 and 29 says this when we think about being thankful. It says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. We ought to be thankful today, church. And we ought to be thankful for far more than I mentioned today. But if you struggle with finding something to be thankful for, how about this? The five that we just mentioned from Psalm 100. God creates us. God creates every one of us. He loves us. He saves us. He sanctifies us. And he what? Sustains. Thank you. You were listening. I appreciate that, Lisa. Hey, we're going to do something together. In your bulletin, I said everyone needs a bulletin. We're going to do an activity together today. And we're going to show God that we are thankful by taking part in this. In your bulletin, there is a card that simply says, be thankful on the front. I want you to just take a moment right now to think about one thing that you're thankful for. And I want you to write it down. And then I want you to, as we end service here in just a little bit, I want you to go out in the foyer and when you take a left down on the carpeted area on the right wall, there is a wall that says, be thankful. And there are things that you can hang those cards on. And we'd love to see the many things that people are thankful for at Bright Christian Church. Wouldn't that be a great way to give God praise, just to fill that wall with things saying, God, I am thankful for this. Let's participate in this. Take a moment right now and write down one thing, and then we are going to pray together here in just a moment. Father, there are hundreds of people in this room right now. Many of them writing down just one thing to be thankful for, and we have many. I pray, Father, that these hundreds of things that are written down and are going to be placed on a wall of thanksgiving, I pray that even right now, praise would just pour out for the many blessings that you have given us. And God, as we continue to lift our voices in music again here in just a few minutes. God, we are grateful for all that you do for us. You are a blessing to us, and we could not imagine life without you. So God, we simply give you thanks, and we stand in awe of you, the one who is worthy. And we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.